We left off in chapter 6 with God telling Moses that he has everything under control. Now, for the Jewish people, their perspective was, we were better off, Moses, before you showed up, because now that you told Pharaoh, let my people go, he's treating us worse. We are being uh, beaten more often. He's doubled the workload upon us. You know, we should have never listened to you, Moses, and so they're mad at him. Uh, in their eyes, Moses gave them false hope because Moses told them, God's going to do all these amazing things. He's going to set us free from Egypt. But as we've seen, God is not giving them false hope because he is about to deliver on his promise. And he is about to deliver on so many promises he's given us here in these last days. So we saw God reassuring Moses once again as he tells him, Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. We saw the seven I wills of God last week where he says, I will deliver you. I will rescue you. I will uh, bring you into the promised land. I will redeem you. And so Moses goes back to his fellow Jews and he's all excited saying, okay, God has given us all these promises. But when he tells them they were so discouraged, so beaten down it says they did not even heed him, or they would not listen to Moses. So then, Moses is now more discouraged than ever. He feels beaten down and discouraged, and he goes back to the Lord and says, Lord, you know, quite frankly, you're not doing anything. You, you told us we're gonna, you're going to do all this stuff, but you're not doing anything for us. I mean, we're feeling more beaten down than ever. Basically, he tells God, I never wanted this job. You know, you should have never enlisted me. I want to quit. Uh, kind of reminds me of the guy who applied for the job at his local zoo. This is very serious, by the way. <laughs> there were no jobs available at the zoo, but he really wanted to work there. And they had one temporary job. And, you know, apparently the, the gorilla had just died. And so it was going to be two or three weeks before they get the next gorilla. And so they said, well, if you're willing, we'll hire you to put on a gorilla suit and you can just pretend to be a gorilla for the next two. Oh, that'd be great. I, I just really want to work for the zoo and I'll do whatever you want me to do. So they gave him the suit and he got in the enclosure and people started coming. And every time they'd come by, he'd start acting goofy and swing from a rope and he'd jump around a little bit. And more and more people, they loved it. And so more people start showing up and uh, and then he starts getting a little more bold. He gets a little more, you know, showing off to the people. And so one day he's hopping around and he goes up on top of the enclosure. And wouldn't you know it, he slips and falls into the next enclosure, which happens to be where the lion was. And so he sees the lion coming towards him very slowly and deliberately. And so he starts to panic and he's like, help, help, get me out of here. And the lion said, would you be quiet? You're going to get us both fired. <laughs> wow. You guys are so much better than the first service. Anyway, has nothing to do with the message. But unlike this guy in the zoo, Moses, he never wanted to be, you know, the leader. He never wanted to be in that place of authority. He, he was, you know, coming up with one excuse after another. Why I'm not the right guy. You're picking the wrong guy. I can't talk very well. And he had all these excuses that we looked at. But God did not hire him for a job. And Moses is slowly learning this. But God called him into ministry. And that's an important truth that must be understood. Ministry is not a job. Ministry is a calling upon our lives that God places upon our lives. And the fact of the matter is, this is why we're seeing every year thousands, literally thousands of pastors get out of the ministry every year in the United States. They wrongly believe that being a pastor is a profession like any other job you train for. You go to school, you learn your craft, you get hired. Well, like I've said for many years now, if I treated this like a job, if I looked at this place as a, a workplace, this would be one of the worst jobs you could ever have. You know, it's not that fun. 
but I certainly would have quit a long time ago, you know, but you realize this is a calling that God puts on your heart, and he changes your heart, and you realize I'm doing what God's called me to do, and it doesn't really matter what everybody else might think if I'm doing what God's called me to do, that's what really matters. And, and like Moses, I've had to come to that realization that ministry is a calling that he places upon your life and like everything else if god calls you to do something for him he will always every time enable you to do what he's called you to do he doesn't you know just say go get a job in ministry he never says that but he calls us into ministry and your secular job by the way is ministry whatever you do don't try to separate separate the sacred from the secular in God's eyes, everything is sacred unto the Lord. You're light and salt wherever you go and whatever you're doing. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. So what things is Peter talking about there? He says, well, growing strong in your faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But then he says, add to your faith virtue, add to virtue knowledge, add to knowledge self-control, add to self-control perseverance, add to perseverance godliness, add to godliness brotherly kindness, add to brotherly kindness love or agape love. And so that's for all of us. Ministry is for all Christians, and each one of us needs to make our call and election sure. That's the only way you can do what God's called you to do and not burn out. And I've seen so many pastors over the years, they burn out. I mean, I'm one, it's, it's weird to think of because I can only think of one pastor in town now that's been doing ministry longer than I have in Grand Junction area. It's crazy. All it means is I'm getting old. You know, that's all it means. But it's just, I've seen so many guys, they come in, they fall away, or they leave, and they're, they're trying to get promoted to a higher place and all that. So it's through trial and error that Moses is learning this important truth. Uh, we left off in chapter 6, verse 13, with God commanding Moses and Aaron to go back to Pharaoh, tell him, let my people go. And so we're about to enter some of the most amazing scenes in the entire Bible. I mean, the book of Exodus is tremendous. I mean, we see all these signs and wonders, miracles that God will do to deliver his people from the bondage of Egypt. Uh, these chapters reverberate down through history. Uh, we see a lot of Psalms written about what we read about in this book of Exodus. Other nations, pagan nations, wrote about what God did to the Egyptians and how he sustained them in the wilderness. We're going to see Passover you know, the Feast of Passover comes out of the book of Exodus in the 10th plague, the model of God's throne room in heaven. Moses is given the instruction on how to build that, the tabernacle here in the book of Exodus. Again, the Ten Commandments we'll look at in chapter 20. And so God has done tremendous things. Here we are 3,500 years later talking about the awesome things God did for his people as he rescued them and set them free from their bondage. Now, it's all exciting. It's so wonderful. So all of a sudden, we come into verse 14, and we have a weird genealogy. It's like, this seems like a weird place for a genealogy. Why do they put this in here? Usually when I look at genealogies, I'm like, oh, great, a bunch of names I don't know how to pronounce. And that's pretty much how you guys look at it as well, I know. When you go through Chronicles, there's so many names. It's like, okay, you read the Chronicles on your own, and then we'll go to the next verse where it stops giving us all these names. But we'll go through these names because for the Jewish people, this is huge. Uh, for Moses and Aaron, who, who are literally ambassadors for God, this genealogy uh, is their credentials. This is like their valid passport. This is giving them the authority to speak and to prove to the Jews we're legitimate. And so we'll see it focuses on three of the 12 tribes of Israel, the first three sons of Jacob, and it zeroes in on one tribe in particular, the tribe of Levi, because that's the priestly tribe that Moses and Aaron descend from. So quickly, let's look at verse 14 of chapter 6. These are the heads of their fathers' houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, 
were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. Some say Carmi. I have no idea. I, I listened to this Jewish guy. He's from Jerusalem, uh, rabbi, messianic guy. He's great. And when he goes through this list, I'm like, they didn't even look the same. I mean, where are you coming up with this pronunciation? Anyway, this is what we see. So any of these names, any of you getting or thinking about getting pregnant, here you go. Baby names. These are the families of Reuben, and the sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, we remember Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations, Gershon, Kohat, and Merari. The, the years of the life of Levi were 137. The sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimi according to their families. The sons of Kohat were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 133. So these guys lived to be pretty old. The sons of Merari were, I like these two, Mali and Mushi. These are the names of Levi. Maybe if we had boys, no, nah, we wouldn't probably use those names. These are the families of, the, of Levi according to their generations. Now Amram took for himself Jochebed, and these names we're familiar with, his father's sister uh, as wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, and the years of the life of Amram were 137. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. And the sons of Uziel were Mishael, el Zapin, and Zithri. <laughs> Aaron took to himself Elishaba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon, as wife, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu. Now, we're familiar with those names. They did something really bad later on in uh, Leviticus. Eleazar and Ithamar. So those are the four sons of Aaron. And they will be priests, well, Eleazar and Ithamar. And the sons of Korah were Asir, Elkanah, and Abi Asaph. These are the families of the Korathites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Putiel as wife, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites according to their families. Now, again, genealogies for the Jews was very big. When they were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, then King Cyrus, when he comes on the scene with the Medo-Persians, he lets them go back to Jerusalem. And when they get back to Jerusalem, if they could not identify their tribe, then they were not allowed to work in the rebuilt temple there. So it was a big deal. They had to go through a big, long process to be reinstated as, as a priest. So here we see that the biggest focus is on the tribe of Levi. Now, God keeps track of his people. I mean, he keeps records. He knows every one of us. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows every single person and every single hair on the head of every single person. Eight billion people on planet Earth presently. He knows them better than we know ourselves. It's amazing. We might get bogged down with all these names, but not God. He's concerned about every single one of you and, and the life you're living. Um, one of my favorite teachings from Jesus, look at these verses. This is a, the parable of the lost sheep in uh, Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 1. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners... Well, who does that include? every single one of us, drew near to him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained. Now, they always complain when sinners come to Jesus, saying, this man, speaking about Jesus, he receives sinners and eats with them. Well, it's a good thing he does, because otherwise Jesus would eat every meal alone. I mean, just think about it. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, 
does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he found it, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. And that's how the Pharisees looked at themselves. We're so righteous, self-righteous, we don't need to repent. And that's why they were excluded from the kingdom of God, because they didn't turn to Jesus. But when you know you're a sinner, when you know you can't save yourself, when you realize only Jesus paid the price in full for my sins, he died in my place, he took the wrath of God upon himself when he hung on the cross, his blood is the only acceptable payment for my sins. When you realize, I need Jesus, I, I can't do this, I can't save myself, I can't even wash anything away out of my life, only Christ can, then you receive him as your Lord and Savior. He will save you, he gives you eternal life because he paid the price in full. He died he was buried. He rose again the third day. That's the gospel. And that's what the Lord uses. That's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will believe. And whoever believes in Christ will not be destroyed, but he will give you everlasting, never-ending life. And so God keeps lots of records. The most important record, though, if you're born again, your name is in it. And that's the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's the most important record, and that's where God knows you personally, intimately, and He has signed, sealed, and saved you for eternity. So make sure your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. You want to know how to get it in there? Let me know, and I'll let you know. I just kind of told you. Just receive Christ. Look at verse 26. These are the same, notice, Aaron and Moses, notice the order there, Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same, Moses and Aaron. Now notice how God changes the order. Moses kept coming up with one excuse after another. I can't, I can't, I can't. And God says, okay, I'll let you take your brother Aaron. He speaks well. And we know Moses spoke well too. But at this point, Aaron will be the chief spokesman. Moses tells him what to say. But then pretty soon, then you see Moses taking that position of authority that God gave him. So it's a process with Moses. But here we see that order reversed from Aaron and Moses to Moses and Aaron. Verse 28. And it came to pass on the day the, the, the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. And here we see it again. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, and how shall Pharaoh heed me? So once again, this is the third time he uses that same excuse. I don't talk too good. It's like Forrest Gump. You know, it's like, no, you're just humble yourself, Moses. God will do it. Just be available. And, and again, it's a process. It's a process with me. It's a process with Moses. It's a process with all of us as we realize I don't have anything to offer, but God can do whatever he wants to do if we'll humble, humble ourselves before him. So, chapter 7, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. Now, when God says, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, he's not saying I'm turning you into a God. I mean, the Mormons actually will use this verse to see, say, well, see, Man can become a god. No, he's just God's representative. You're, you're a mouthpiece in my hands is what God is telling uh, Moses here. You're just an instrument in my hands. This is really a definition of a prophet. I'll put the words in your mouth, Moses. You can tell Aaron. He will speak. What is a prophet? One who speaks forth the truth of God's word. Prophet's nothing special. It's one who speaks forth the truth of God's word. God is special. 
He'll use anybody that he calls into ministry. And so, once again, for the third time, God reiterates what he's going to do uh, with Moses and Aaron as they confront Pharaoh. Look at verse 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt, but Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Again, there's a couple of things to take note of in these verses. Once again, we see God will harden Pharaoh's heart. But don't forget, we've already seen this. He says Pharaoh's going to harden his heart towards God. Pharaoh hardens his heart towards God. The first five judgments, Pharaoh hardens his heart. Then God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And there's two different words that mean, like for Pharaoh, he's resisting, he's rebelling what God's calling him to do. And so God is essentially saying, okay, you want your heart to go that direction, I'll let it go that direction. And it's like the, the word in, in Hebrew for God hardening his heart is that's what you want to do, so I'll turn the heat up. It's like putting clay in an oven. It'll make it harder and harder. And that's what God will end up doing with Pharaoh. You want the heat turned up in your life? You want to resist me? Okay, I'm going to let you go that direction. Now, it's also interesting to me, God uses these two phrases here in describing his people. First, he calls them my armies, and then he says my people. This is a great example of how God sees things very differently than most of us see things. I mean, I kind of understand God calling the Jewish people his people. After all, they're the 12 tribes of Israel. They're, they are God's chosen people. I don't have an issue with that, but when uh, he says here, my armies? Okay, think of the Jews right now. They had zero implements of war, no weapons. They didn't even know how to fight any spiritual battle. They had no spiritual weapons. We've seen the Jews at this point in their lives are pretty much faithless. God is faithful, but they're pretty much faithless. They're just like, you shouldn't have come here, Moses. You're getting us in bigger trouble. And so they're upset. But again, God doesn't just see the outward side of a person. He sees the heart. He sees the potential of what we can be if we will humble ourselves before God and let God work in us and through us. When the godly prophet Samuel, you know, he had to learn this the hard way as well. He was called by God, go to Jesse. And Jesse's got a bunch of sons. And you're going to pick a new king because King Saul had hardened his heart towards the Lord. And so go to Jesse's house and I'll show you who the new king of Israel is going to be. And so the first seven sons of Jesse come into the room. And there's Samuel and he sees Eliab, the firstborn. And as Eliab, this young strapping man, comes walking through, uh, Samuel says, Surely the Lord's anointed is among you, speaking to God. And this is what God says in response. It's 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so, second son, third son, four, all the way down, seven sons, and God's like, nope, none of them. And so then Samuel says, do you have any other kids? Well, yeah, I have this little ruddy guy. He's out there with my sheep, tending the sheep out in the field. Bring him in. So they bring in the youngest, David, and he would be the one. David later on is called a man after God's own heart. Not perfect by any means, but God saw and knew this is the guy that's going to be the next king in Israel. In John 7, verse 24, Jesus tells us, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. In other words, use wisdom, use discernment that comes from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, but don't judge just looking at people, sizing them up, and then you think, oh, I know everything. No, you don't know anything. I don't know anything. God knows the heart. That's what he's concerned with. Well, look at verse 5. 
and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So not only would all the Jews see the mighty hand of God at work, but also the Egyptians. Many Egyptians will get saved. Most won't, but many will turn to the one true living God. God's judgment against Egypt is primarily because of how they treated God's people, the Jews. Don't forget, God's vengeance is also because of Pharaoh and many of these Egyptians taking Jewish baby boys, throwing them into the Nile River, killing them. God's vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know, God is going to do the same thing to every nation in the world but Israel, but he's going to do the same thing to our nation. 60 million abortions? Now it's way over that. You know, we've got, we're, we're a bloody people. We're no better than the Egyptians were. So many people proudly defend and promote their wickedness, their wicked lifestyles. I'm glad we're not in June any longer. Pride Month. Okay. Verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. So, And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So don't think, man, I'm going to do all this stuff when I retire. No, be a servant, whatever age you are. We're light and salt no matter how young or old we are. I mean, God is starting his ministry at 80. So don't think, well, now I'm 80, I'm too old. Moses didn't have any good excuse. He already tried all of his excuses out on God, and God said, no, you're the guy. Yeah, you're 80. Your brother's 83, but here we go. Moses and Aaron will once again, they'll step out in faith. They're going to obey the Lord here. They'll stand before Pharaoh, but this time they have God's power on display before them. They are slowly but surely learning that sometimes God does things right now and when we pray for people, you know, it's always, okay, Lord, I know you can heal. You can do it right now. You're the God of all wonders. But sometimes he, it's a process. Sometimes he says, no, I will heal, but maybe later. Larry, he's home with Jesus. You think he's healed? Yep. He experienced the greatest healing of all. You know, he, he's losing his mind through dementia, Alzheimer's. You think he's hurting now? Uh, uh, no way. Now, I know so many people, they've gone home to be with the Lord. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. So God sometimes heals instantly. Sometimes it's a process. But it's our responsibility to simply wait on the Lord, trust that his timing is perfect. After all, he is God. Well, look at verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves. And this is even before the ten plagues start. Then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. Take note of that word serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Again, same word. Take note of that. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments or their secret arts. For every man threw down his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. So here's, you know, Pharaoh, show me a sign. Okay. He throws down his staff, and Aaron's staff turns into a crocodile. Earlier in chapter 4, when Moses has his staff, and God tells him from the burning bush, throw it on your staff, and it becomes a snake or a serpent. Take it up by the tail. That was nephesh, the Hebrew word. This is a different word. It's tannin, T-A-N-N-I-N, -N which is usually translated crocodile. And so Aaron's staff goes down, and it's a crocodile. I mean, I'd love to see this. This is awesome. And then these Pharaoh's guys, they throw down their staffs, and they turn into whatever slithering thing they are, serpents, smaller alligators. But, man, can you imagine? Here's Aaron's, you know, big alligator on the ground. You know, it's like Pac-Man, you know, chewing them all up, swallowing them down. 
And he picks it up by the tail and it's back into his staff, right? That's what God told him to do. But it doesn't even move. Pharaoh, he just like shrugs it off. Oh, well, big deal. The cool thing is, I, again, this is a guy thing, you know, watching crocodiles eat other little animals and just chew them down. And you ever watch those nature shows and, you know, you see the cheetah chasing after the gazelle. Or it's like, come on, go faster, go faster, get him, get him. And Elizabeth's like, no, I don't want to see the gazelle get eaten. That's a guy thing. That's okay. The Apostle Paul uses this Old Testament scene as an example of the last days when it comes to so many lying signs and wonders and false teachers that are going to come on the scene. 2 Timothy 3, verses 8 and 9, and this is the only place we have two of the names given to us of these enchanter, these magicians. It says, Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Talking about last days false teachers. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, or revealed to all, as theirs, Janice and Jambres, also was. Here's the application for us today. The truth of God's word and the truth of who Jesus Christ, the truth of who he is and what he's done for us, will gobble up and eat up, devour all of Satan's lies. We don't need to listen to Satan's lies. They're empty. I mean, he can say whatever he wants to say. God doesn't love you. God you know, wants to send you to the lake of fire. God, no, those are lies from the enemy. You listen to God's word. His truth will set you free. His truth will devour the lies of the serpent, the original serpent, Satan. It's also important to understand that Satan is a master deceiver. We see these guys imitating to some degree what Moses and Aaron are doing, but they're very limited. The first three plagues that God will send upon the Egyptians, for whatever reason, these Egyptian mag magicians imitate those three plagues. Think about how stupid that is. Turning water into blood. Oh, we'll turn more water into blood. It's like, really? Okay. We're going to bring frogs on the land. We're going to bring more frogs. Really? That's helping? That's not helping. But he's a master deceiver. You look at Galatians chapter 1, God says, or Paul says, there's one gospel, you know, that saves. And he says, even if I or an angel from heaven speak any other gospel to what you already received, let him be a curse. There's only one gospel, but Satan will come with a false gospel. Our neighbors to the west are building a temple here in our town. Do you think that's the true gospel? Absolutely not. Jesus is not the spirit brother of Lucifer. We don't get saved after all we can do to earn salvation. It's a false gospel. He has a counterfeit righteousness. Satan tells us, oh, you can work your way to heaven. You can earn your salvation. That's a lie. They try to use the law to justify it, but you can't. Paul says this. Look at these verses, Romans 10, verses 3 and 4. It says, For they are ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jesus is the only one who fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. Yeah, you can save yourself if you can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. Can you do it? No. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. You can try to keep all the law, and James says if you stumble in one little point of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. Only Jesus lived a perfect life. Only he fulfilled the law perfectly. Only he is righteous. And so now when we come to Christ, he will give us his very own righteousness. We don't deserve that. But Satan's going around saying, oh, no, you can earn your salvation. You can work hard enough, do enough good deeds. How many people have you talked to over the years, maybe at Thanksgiving, with your relatives, your friends? Oh, yeah, I try to live by the Ten Commandments, so surely God will let me in. No, not even if your name's Shirley. He won't let you in unless you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm sorry. Anyway. 
According to, and these aren't on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, that's where Paul warns about Satan and his false apostles coming on the scene. He says Satan can turn himself into an angel of light. And so his false teachers, they can come on the scene looking like legitimate apostles. He goes, no, you'll know them by their fruits. You'll also know them by what they say. Anything that deviates from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, is not the gospel. You can look it up. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Paul's very adamant. The gospel is Jesus Christ died for our sins. That's first importance. Buried in the tomb, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel that you're saved by, that you hold fast to, that you should never waver from. Jesus did everything. All we can do is put our faith and trust in him alone. He's the master manipulator. He's the master deceiver, counterfeiter. His greatest counterfeit is coming in the near future to planet Earth. Who's that? The Antichrist. He's going to look like, sound like, Everything the world wants in a Messiah, but he's the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist. But the bottom line in this scene is that God, the God of Moses, the God of Aaron, is superior to all the false gods of Egypt. That'll be more obvious as we go through the ten plagues. And almost, well, no, every plague that God brings against the Egyptians and Pharaoh are an attack against the pagan gods of Egypt. Yes, they had a frog god they worshipped. We'll talk more about that next time. But notice in verse 13, Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them. Again, he's so blinded by his pride that he doesn't even acknowledge what he just witnessed with his own two eyes. Seeing is not always believing. We should understand that. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. A lot of people say, oh, if I just see a miracle, then I'll believe. Are you kidding me? We're going to see miracle after miracle after miracle through Exodus. And then you get into you know, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and it says that whole first generation of Jews that come out of Egypt, how many go into the promised land out of approximately 3 million Jews? Well, 2 million that were 20 and older. Only two made it into the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else perished in the wilderness. Why? because of their lack of faith, their unbelief. They saw miracle every day. Cloud of, you know, pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day, manna from heaven, water from a rock. Tevas, sandals, never wore out, it said. After 40 years, they never wore out. One miracle after another, God did everything, and yet they did not enter in because of their unbelief. Jesus, for three and a half years, Cleansing lepers, healing sick people, opening blind eyes, ears. I mean, everything. Raising people from the dead. Limbs back, fingers back on lepers. The Pharisees saw them. Show us the sign. They saw the signs. They're the ones that stirred up the crowd when he's standing before Pontius Pilate. Crucify him, crucify him. Seeing is not always believing. But that should be obvious when it comes to all the occult practices that people get caught up in today. God is superior to all these pretend things. And they are. They're satanic, demonic, like Ouija boards, tarot cards, astrology, you know, horoscopes, fortune tellers, drugs that are used for illicit purposes to contact the dead and the spirit world. It's just demonic. And God says, these things are an abomination to me. Do not practice these things. God warns. He forbids them throughout Scripture. In fact, God will show us his superiority over Satan and his imitations. As we'll see, the sorcerers, they're limited in what they can do. God will say, okay, now I'm cutting you off. You can't imitate anything else. And God will prove himself without any doubt that he alone is God. So let's look at the first plague real quick, verse 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water, and you shall stand by the river's bank, so this is the Nile River, to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand. And you shall say to him, 
The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But indeed, until now, you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink. And the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died, the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river, so there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. So... Amazing. God tells him, go out there, stretch out the rod over the Nile River, and he does. And, you know, Moses basically telling Pharaoh, good morning, Pharaoh. Let God's people go. If not, this is what's going to happen. And apparently, Pharaoh just blows him off. Like, nope, I don't even want to listen to you. And so he stretches out the rod over the river. Everything starts turning to blood. The river, the streams, the pools. I mean, they had swimming pools. They had other ponds, it says here. There are water pitchers in their house. There are basins. I mean, everything turns to blood. Now, this is a direct attack. There's three gods over the Egyptians. This one was probably directed toward one called Happy. <laughs> Not so happy after this. H-A-P-I was one of their main gods. He was the, the god of um, agriculture. He was the god of prosperity. He was the one that they worshipped, you know, that gave them sustenance and nourishment from the Nile River. I mean, the Nile River, if you didn't have that in Egypt, it would be like the book cliffs over here. In fact, if we didn't have the Colorado River and the Gunnison River, we would be just like Egypt. Nothing. Dirt. That's it. But he was the God that God goes against. And so what a fitting judgment by the one true God. Striking. And really the Egyptians believed the Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt. And so God says, okay, you like blood so much. You like shedding my people's blood. I'm going to make you smell, taste, and, you know, eat, drink blood. You love it so much. Amazing. This... I believe, is the reason why God was giving the opportunity to these people to stop and think, okay, we're in trouble here. Our, our world is in jeopardy. Um, our immediate resource for why we're prosperous is turned to blood. You'd think this would get their attention. You'd think they would start wanting to know, okay, what's behind this? I see the same thing happening in our world today. You know, Jesus says that just before he returns and sets up his kingdom on earth, this world is going to go through birth pangs or labor pains. And all you moms in here, you know about labor pains. They start off yeah, a little bit intense, and then it backs off for a while, gets a little bit more intense, backs off for a while, gets pretty intense and then it backs off for a while then it gets really really intense and you're screaming at your husband for doing this to you and you're screaming and you're like, ah give me something and so that's how it is the closer you get to having the baby the more intense those labor pains become and jesus said that is how it's going to be in this world before he comes back just like labor pains it's getting more and more intense hundred years ago, it was getting intense. World War I, World War II, a little more intense. We're getting into the place where, I don't know if we'll see it or not, Ezekiel 38 and 39 war, that's going to be really intense. 
Things are heating up. This is what Jesus says about the last days, Matthew 24, starting in verse 4. Jesus said, answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. We're seeing more and more false teachers out there all the time. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, we're hearing a lot of that. I mean, all these things have been around since the beginning, but they're just intensifying. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation. Remember, it's ethnos. The Greek word is ethnos, or ethos, where we get ethnos from. And it literally means ethnic problems rising up. Kingdom against kingdom, so nation against nation. You know, we're seeing that with uh, Russia, Ukraine, or hearing China, you know, wanting to come against Taiwan, uh, North Korea, who knows what they're thinking, they're always off the wall. But then he says there'll be famines. Again, we've always had these things, but they're getting worse. Birth pangs are getting stronger. Pestilences, earthquakes. That's something that's measurable. I mean, when you look at the earthquakes in the world, they've been tracking these for many, many centuries. And man, they're more numerous, stronger than ever before. Earthquakes in various places. And then he says, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Literally, these are the beginning of labor pains. And so things are getting more intense. Now in Egypt, God used all these various natural disasters to try and wake up the people and some will recognize God is in control, but most do not. The same is true today. We see all kinds of weather changes. We see ecological disasters, earthquakes increasing, diseases and viruses spreading. Most people are crying out to Mother Earth. we got to save Mother Earth. Mother Earth is revolting against us wicked humans. Instead, everybody should be crying out in repentance to Father God because he's the one that's allowing these things to happen and they're going to increase. God's putting the squeeze on us because he's wanting people to turn to him before it's too late. So, verse 22, let's wrap this up. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went to into his house, neither was his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink. So they're digging as deep as they can, hoping some of the bloody water will filtrate as it goes through the sand, because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. So again, the crazy thing to me is the Egyptian sorcerers only make things worse. And that's kind of where we are as a nation, as a world. Without God, we just make things worse. Every time they come up, oh, we got to do this. Save Mother Earth. They make things worse. They don't think about the long-term ramifications. You know, all the cobalt and everything else. We're having all these slave laborers in China and other places in Africa digging, these kids digging up dirt so we can have more electric batteries, solar power, and everything else. That's fine. God said, you want solar power? We saw this in the book of Revelation. He heats up the earth, and it scorches everybody on the earth. You don't want to be around during the Great Tribulation. God's going to let it all out, just like he's doing here with Egypt on a small scale. He's going to do on a worldwide scale, because all these same judgments you find in the book of Revelation. Pretty interesting, but on a global scale. All the oceans are going to be dead. All the sea creatures are going to die. Talk about a stench. Here it's just the Nile River. Be that as it may, it's interesting how Satan works. He promises to make life easier, make life more fun, make it a lot better, but he always has death and destruction on his mind. Even though sin is pleasurable for a season, it always ends up hurting yourself or hurting those around you. But God's ways are always best. His ways aren't always easy, but living for Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit will always produce good fruit in your life, both now and into eternity. So don't be like Pharaoh. Don't harden your heart. If God's knocking on the door of your heart, like Jesus says there in Revelation 3.20, 
where he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. I'll dine with him because he likes to eat with sinners. I'll dine with him and he with me. I'm so glad I surrendered my heart to Jesus November 30th, 1977. When I say that, it sounds like a long time ago. <laughs> And it is. It was like two weeks before I'm going to have a big 21-year birthday bash and all my friends were going to throw me a kager at San Diego State and then I got saved and ruined their plans. <laughs> but it was the best decision I ever made. God got a hold of me, saved me, changed me, and I've never looked back. Don't harden your heart. Best thing you can do, surrender your life to Jesus today because he does love you. He does care for you. How do we know he loves us? Romans 5 eight. God demonstrates his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus dying on the cross, shedding his blood for you. That's all the evidence you need to know that the creator of the universe loves you. And he has every single hair in your head numbered. Sure.